We hear a lot about Dad's friends uh, when you talk to him and also in his book. We hear about Bob Creviston and Art Neff and Jack Lytle. And he has a story that fills out the picture a little more. It's called Some of My Best Friends Were Dogs. So we'd like to share that with you now. Many a happy day during my growing up years was spent playing with our pet dogs. Let me tell you about some of them. The first dog that came into my life you've already heard about today was called Queen. She was an older beagle with popping eyes and a gray muzzle. She was a three-family dog with Spidells to the west, and then the Murrays, and then Perry Anderson to the east. She lined whichever backyard had the most shade. Unfortunately, she got prime table scraps from both sides and she became too fat to run rabbits very well. But Perry Anderson would come out of his back door and give a melodious whistle reserved just for Queen. If she was in our house, she'd be frantic until we let her out. Then off she'd go with Perry to Baxter's Woods. Perry would harvest his night crawlers and green moss for his dewworms, while Queen sniffed for rabbits. They'd return in a couple of hours and both had their tongues hanging out. <laughs> Queen died one morning while I was in school, and when I came home at noon, I was devastated to have lost my dear old friend. But Perry was equally as devastated, and he missed her as much as I did. My dad also missed having a beagle around the house. He liked to take them out and listen to them bell as they would chase a rabbit. I think I was about 10 years old at around this time because in 1935 was when McKinley Canner published the book The Voice of Bugle Ann. I got it from the library and I read it and I had dad read it too. The book was about a foxhound named Bugle Ann with a beautiful belling voice. And a foxhound actually looks a lot like an oversized beagle standing about 20 inches at the shoulder, but the largest beagle only reaches about 15 inches or less in height. Well, that book stoked my dad's fire. <laughs> and so, one Sunday, found my dad, mom, and me on our way to Cincinnati to a sporting dog show. The highways were very icy, and when we got to Piqua, about 40 miles from Lima, mom wanted to turn around and go home. But dad persisted and we drove the 120 miles to the dog show. There we saw a perky little beagle who was such a friendly little dog, and he won his class in the show, though not best of breed for the beagles. Dad went over and talked to the owner who had several dogs in the show. The dog that we like was American Kennel Club registered under the name of War Cry II. He'd won several field trials and several bench shows, but his owner thought that he was a little temperamental and he wasn't good enough to become a field trial champion, which is what he really wanted. So dad got the owner's name, and address, and phone number, and the asking price for this little gem of a dog. All the way back to Lima, all dad and I could talk about was this wonderful little dog. Mom said he was nice, but she didn't know if we could afford $35 for a dog. In 1935, that was a chunk. But dad pestered mom long enough till she gave in. He wrote the owner, sent him a check, and the owner sent us our dream dog by Railway Express. What a joy it was when I came home from school one day and there he was, American Kennel Club papers and all, War Cry the Second. His name was indeed War Cry the Second, but his owner explained to us after we bought him that he would actually only answer to the name Ace. <laughs> well, things, things went pretty well with our dog Ace until one winter's day when my mom came, my mom came home from the store she came in the side door, set her bags of groceries down on the floor, went to the front door and got the evening's newspaper. She took off her coat and stood over a hot air register to get warm while she read the obituary columns. <laughs> Suddenly, she became aware of the sound of paper rustling. She went to check her bag of groceries, and there she witnessed Ace just finishing off a pound of bacon. She let out a whoop, picked up the newspaper, and chased that poor dog from the kitchen to the dining room to the living room, then back to the kitchen, swatting him all the time with the newspaper. The poor dog got so upset that he vomited his bacon out on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to rescue him and take him out to his kennel. Mom wouldn't even let him back in the house for a week. But they finally made up. Now, Dad had been talking about having a brace or a pair of beagles to hunt together. And so he also bought a dog a little taller than Ace. His name was Vic. When a beagle is hunting, his tail is referred to as his flag. And sometimes when he is hunting in heavy, uh, in heavy brush, all you can really see is his flag. Vic had a good flag, but he wasn't near the hunter that Ace was, and he was a little mean to Ace, not the thing to be. 
So Dad traded Vic for another dog named Sniffer. This dog looked more like a basset hound than a beagle, and because of his shorter legs, he was much slower. Well, when we'd gone to Cincinnati, I had really been, been impressed by that dog show that we saw. And that was the dog show where we found Ace. Well, one day I saw an article in the newspaper that there was going to be a sporting dog show on Labor Day over in Dunkirk at the Leafy Oaks Coon Dog Field Trials. Colonel Leon Robinson was, sporting, uh, was sponsoring the show, it said. I thought I'd write and get the details and maybe even enter ourselves. I prevailed upon Mom and Dad to let me enter Ace in the show. I sent in his registration and the entry fees, but I only had about a month to work with Ace. I trotted him on his leash and I taught him to stand still on the bench and hold up his tail, not to flinch when the judge would lift his lips to check his teeth. While I was working with Ace, my older brother Marvin would smirk and he'd give me reason after reason why I was wasting my time. He said Ace's muzzle wasn't trim enough, so I took Dad's barber scissors and I cut Ace's whiskers flush. <laughs> well, the day came and Mom, Dad, and I went to Dunkirk along with Ace to the dog show. I won't drag it out, but suffice it to say that Ace won best of class, best of breed, and he went on to win best of show. <laughs> when we got home, my formerly scornful brother opined that he'd given me the right pointers to produce a show winner. <laughs> This was heady stuff for an 11-year-old kid. And I liked these dog shows, and the next spring I read about another big sporting dog show to be held in Ravenna, Ohio in the early summer. It was to be held in the middle of the week, though, and Dad had to work. But I did successfully prevail upon Mom to take me and Ace to the show. It was about 100 miles away, and we got there in time, but I found out that most of the men and women showing dogs were professionals, and they made their living doing this. Well, Ace and I, therefore, became the sentimental favorites of the crowd. And when Ace won best of class and best of breed, I had a regular cheering section when it came to best of show competition. I had to go to the restroom, so I told Mom to hold Ace's leash. While I was in there, I overheard the judge talking to some of the men, and he said, we can't let this kid walk away with this prize, or the trainers won't be back next year. They called, so out we came, and they called for the finalist dogs in the best of show category to enter the arena. Ace strutted like he knew what he had to do to win, and the crowd was with us. But a beautiful Irish setter was awarded best to show, and Ace got second place. The judge called us aside and congratulated us and suggested that I get cinders into his run to toughen his feet and make him more bouncy and other things. I just smiled up at him, and I said, I understand. We didn't get home till 11 o'clock that night. My dad and brothers were worried sick. We called the highway patrol and the sheriff's department to see if there had been any accidents reported. So that was the last dog show for Ace and me. But another Beagle owner in the area had seen Ace, and he propositioned, Ace, he propositioned Dad to have Ace sire some puppies from his female. The terms were that we'd get the pick of the litter. Came the day, and Dad and I went to pick up the puppy, and there was the male pup, the spitting image of Ace. And so we took possession of Warcry the Third. He was later to be called Pippi, though, for two reasons. Number one, he was a pip of a pup. And number two, he pippied on the floor rather than on the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> when Pippi came, we sold Sniffer, and so we just had two dogs, father and son. Since we had to concern ourselves with Pippi's education and make him able to hunt, Dad helped me to make a lightweight trailer mounted on bicycle wheels and I could pull this easily behind my bike. I would load the two dogs into their trailer and fasten it to my bike and off we'd go out to Robb Avenue and then on farther west about a quarter of a mile. And there we'd find a lane that had been worn into the ground by ruts and we'd go on back into the woods and brambles. I think this area years later was developed and became Englewood Estates. Ace was the teacher and Pippi was the pupil and together they made beautiful music trailing rabbits. The next November, when hunting season was just a week off, I began making plans to get out of school on opening day so I could go hunting with my dad and brothers. I'd acquired a new Ithaca Featherlight 20 gauge pump shotgun and I was most anxious to try it out. School principal said I could not be let out until noon of opening day. But dad and my brother said they couldn't wait for me because they had to go about 50 miles where the, the pheasants were most plentiful. 
So they wouldn't wait for me at all. And so when I got out at noon, I just put my dogs in their trailer and slung my shotgun in its case over my shoulder, and we went off to our usual Rob Avenue training grounds. That afternoon, I got two cock pheasants and two rabbits, and I put my dogs in their trailer, and we went triumphantly home. About three hours later, my dad and brothers returned, and they'd been skunked. That's what they get for not waiting for me. I didn't let them forget my prowess for quite a while. When my folks moved out to their new house and farm on Stewart Road, Pippi wasn't used to the speeding vehicles on the country road, and he got hit by a car. We took him to one of, the, to one of my childhood heroes, Dr. Joseph Morris, our veterinarian. Turned out that Pippi was uh, lucky, and he only had a lower spinal injury. However, this resulted in a paralyzed tail, and from then on, whenever he'd hunt, we could never see his flag. <laughs> I'd gone to college in 1943, and one day I got a letter from Mom telling me that Ace had died, and Dad had buried him under a beautiful big elm tree in our pasture, about 100 yards from the barn. The next time I went home, I went up to the barn to help out, and I saw Pippi sitting beside Ace's grave. We called him and he trotted very slowly to us. All the while he kept looking back at his father's grave. Back in college, I was called to active army duty in a flurry of travel. I had basic training in Texas in X-ray technology school in Atlanta. And then after a 10-day furlough home, I uh, got to visit mom, dad, and Pippi. I returned to Texas and was assigned to the 241st General Hospital. They moved me by train to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, which was a staging area for going to Europe. I ended up in France, and while I was in France, I got word from Mom that Pippi had died, and Dad had buried him beside Ace, his father. And so, my friends, very sadly, the dog days of my youth came to their close. 